Thanks for tuning in to the Oasis Church. The Oasis Church exists to glorify God through the making of disciples and the preaching of God's Word. If you would like to learn more about the Oasis Church, visit us online at www.theoasischurch.net. Hi, Pastor Scott, Pastor of the Oasis Church. Listen, we are so glad you've decided to join in and listen to what God has placed upon our hearts. We pray this will be a great resource for you, but it won't take the place of your local church. We encourage you that if you're not a part of a local body, that you get involved as quickly as possible. We pray that this will stir your affections towards Christ. Enjoy. <clears throat> the goose has been cooked. The goose has been cooked. Has anyone ever heard that expression before? Yeah. yeah. Does anyone know where it came from? In about 1370, we're not sure exactly the date, but somewhere around 1370, was born a man named John Huss. In 1415, John Huss was burned at the stake by the Roman Catholic Church. 102 years before Martin Luther would nail his theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany. How did John Huss get his name? You see, in those times, they were still using your last names depending on what town you're from. So he was from the town of Husenek, uh, and Husenek, translated into English, is Goose Town. Born to poor farmer parents. Huss had a brilliant mind, and he, had, he knew that there was only one way to escape poverty in those times, and that was simple. Become a priest, get his bachelor's degree, his master's degree, and the church will take care of you for the rest of your life. So that's exactly what Huss did. He went, he studied as hard as he could. He became a priest and was given in uh, the Bohemian area, which is now the Czech Republic, Bethlehem Chapel, the largest chapel in the Czech Republic at the time, seating about 3,000 people. And Huss had one problem. He would read the Bible, and he would listen to other pastors, and he would say, these two are not matching. These two are not matching. And so Huss called the learned men foolish and kept asking, what does the Bible say? The Roman Catholic Church caught wind of it and they expelled him from the Bethlehem Chapel where he fled into the countryside and he continued to preach there. They then heard wind of it because people would take his preaching, they would go back into the city, and they would say, here's God's word. And the problem is, it did not line up with what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching. And so he was arrested and charged with three heresies. Do you know what those three heresies were? First, that the church was made up of all believers. That was his first heresy that the church was made up of all believers. How terrible of a statement. Because the Roman Catholic Church believed that the church was made up of popes, cardinals, and bishops. But Huss says, not according to the scripture. The second horrible heresy that Huss gave was he was charged that the authority of the Bible was higher than the pope, and even the church itself. Again, what a horrific heresy. That he said, thus says the Lord governs everything the church does. And everyone needs to come under what God's word says. Yet, that was not what actually got him burned. What got him cooked, what got the goose cooked was his final Horrific heresy. The Pope is not the head of the church. Jesus Christ and his word are the head of the church. And for that, John Huss was burned. And as he sat there tied to that wooden stake, he said something so phenomenal. He said this, Today you will bake a goose, but there will come a swan who you will not be able to cook.
102 years later, Martin Luther walks to the Wittenberg church and nails his 95 theses that ignites the Protestant Reformation. Church, we are in a protest. We have been in a protest since all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 because Satan has one question and one question only. Did God really say? Did God really say? That's the question you and I ask. Whenever something comes out, we always ask, did God really say? And for us to say, God doesn't speak into that, I want to tell you, it means we might have to read a little bit more. Because we are in a fight for the supremacy and the inerrancy of the Bible itself. And so... Martin Luther recognized he was the swan who would not be cooked. Because we are still pleading with people, no God's word. We are pleading with people in our one-to-one discipleships, in our home groups. Do you know what God's word says? Are we willing to say our opinions are secondary compared to God's word? That's the question of God's true Church, that's the question we asked last week. Bring out the book is what the Israelites said when they rededicated the temple. And remember, it was from the temple of Ezra. When Ezra dedicated the temple, God's people were known as what? The people of the book. And church, I pray the Oasis Church will always be known as the church that is governed by the book. And may we never ever lose sight of thus says the Lord. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to grab them. Turn with me, Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. We are working our way through Nehemiah. Uh, We're working our way through Nehemiah. After Nehemiah, we're going to go into Ephesians, and I love Ephesians. It's all about in him, and we're going to start off in Ephesians 1 about election Not the election most of you are thinking about, obviously. We're going to talk about God's election of his people in chapter 1 and the beautiful gospel that is worked through in Ephesians. So we are excited um, as we're continuing through Nehemiah and also looking forward to uh, when we get into the book of Ephesus. So uh, here we are, Nehemiah chapter 9. And so I want to remind us where we've been. Nehemiah completes the wall. The wall is completed. He builds the wall. Remember, Nehemiah is not about building a wall. We all understand that because if it was about building a wall, it'd be through the whole book. It's only in six chapters. There's 13 chapters. So you've got seven chapters that have nothing to do with the wall. So please don't use Nehemiah as a building campaign, a building project, a, 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 a argument for walls or whatever, um, because God God has us build walls and he has us tear our own walls down. So here we've got Nehemiah. He's built a wall. And what does he do? He turns over his governance to who? To, first of all, two guys who had two requirements, faithful and God-fearing. And so we talked in our first week that these two words are very, very important. Why? Because God-fearing makes sure we understand that we are to never take the beautiful salvation God has given us for granted. That you and I are to make sure that obedience matters, that God's word matters, and then faithfulness is to remind us to be faithful to God because he is ever so faithful to us. Then last week we saw what? Bring out the book, pastor. I want the book. I don't want your opinion. I don't want your political slant. I don't care about anything going on in the culture. I care about one thing and one thing only. What does God require of his people? And that will always be the cry of God's true church is saying, bring out the book. I want to know what it says. And so your pastors here at this church, we make sure that we believe in the exegetical teaching of God's word. What does that mean? We want you to see what the Bible says. We could not care less about our personal opinions because they're worth about as far as you can get to your car. And so last week we saw bring out the book. And today we are going to see what happens when people read God's word. And confession and repentance is what follows. Confession and repentance is the natural reaction to when people read God's word. 
because we are always tempted to think, did God really say? Did God really say that if you look at someone with hate, you're guilty of murdering them? Yes, he did. Gosh, Jesus, that's harsh. Yes, and it reminds us how serious holiness is. Church, we must never take holiness lightly. Far be it from us. And so what we're going to see is confession and repentance. And we're going to see a people broken over God's word. And as we look at last week, bring out the book, what follows is our brokenness over God's word and the brokenness over our sin. Remember David, a man after God's own heart, right? God says, what? You search the outer man, I search the inner man, and I found that this man is the man after God's own heart. And guess what is so beautiful? You read that beautiful chapter in Psalm 51 that says, what? I am undone over my sin. Do you have that heart this morning? Are you undone over your sin? So that's what we're going to see this morning. Um, By God's grace and God's grace alone, y'all will still love me after this Sunday. So let us pray together. Father God, your word is in infinitely deep. It is the well in which we drink from. The promise is that if we drink from you, we will never, ever thirst again. God, we keep coming back to your well that never, ever runs out. God, as Jeremiah had an argument against the people, he said, you've hewn for yourself broken cisterns that can't hold water. God, we pray that we will not go to our broken cisterns, but we will come before you with humble and contrite hearts to hear from you this morning. Now, church, I ask that you pray for me. Pray that I'll be helpful to you. Pray that God will speak to me. He'll speak through me. Now, church, I ask that you pray for yourself. I ask that you pray that God will open your ears and open your mind and penetrate your heart with his word this morning. Father God, use this time for your glory, for your majesty. We pray these things because of your son's atoning work on the cross through the spirit that's alive and active within us. Amen. It's interesting to me. I find it so fascinating that when things go bad in a culture, everyone seems to break out Revelation. And when they break out Revelation, the book that they've kind of neglected for a while, everyone suddenly becomes experts in Revelation, right? Uh, We saw this when as early as when John was writing the book of Revelation, Domitian was in charge of the Roman Empire, and what was he was doing is he was persecuting the Christians. He was persecuting the Christians, so this end seemed imminent for John himself. And then what do we see next? And we get to the Crusades, and uh, people are taking over these cities, and everyone thought, ah, here is the end. The great beast has arrived, and God will set up his throne. We get to the Reformation and what has happened, that the Reformers were pretty sure that the Antichrist and the false prophet was the Pope and the Catholic Church And then we get to World War II, suddenly Hitler is now the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, And then we get to today, and we still see people making stuff up like Bill Gates is going to give us the mark of the beast or whatever nonsense people are saying. Forget the fact that they've actually done their good biblical exegesis. They've listened to some crazy person. Sorry, that was my soapbox. Just please don't listen to stupid people. I'm begging you don't listen to stupid people. Um, And so what we then see, though, is people, when they think of Revelation, has suddenly forgotten the first three chapters of Revelation, the most easy to interpret. You have John, he's on the island of Patmos, back-breaking work. They're going to work him to the day he dies. He's an old man, and they're whipping him. They're beating him with back-breaking labor. Christ comes, and he says, write this down, John, John. 
And it says that he saw Christ and Christ was flaming sword coming out of his tongue, ready to do war. And in chapters two and three, he's writing to seven churches. And it says, all of you churches need to listen to my letters to these seven churches. And what these seven churches then are, are a type of church that we will see and what we are supposed to do as a church, we're supposed to look at those seven churches and we're supposed to honestly look at ourselves and say, which one are we? Of the seven churches, five of the seven have a grievance that Jesus gives against those churches. Five of the seven. Two are doing really well. Five are not. And all five have one common theme through all five, and that is the call to repentance. Think about it. The world has gone awry, Domitian killing Christians, and Christ is concerned with the holiness of his church. Can't say amen. You've got to say ouch. So to the church of Ephesus, he says, repent, repent, or I'll remove the lampstand out of its place if you don't repent. To the church of Paragamus, he says, repent or else I'm coming to you quickly and I'll make war against them with my mouth. To the church of Thyatira, he says, I gave her time to repent. She doesn't want to repent of her immorality. I'll throw her on a bed of sickness. Those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds and I'll kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I'll give to each one according to your deeds. To Sardis, he says, repent. If you do not wake up, I'll come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come. And to the completely dead church of Laodicea, he says what? Be zealous and repent. Why do I bring up these seven churches? Why do I bring up these seven churches? We need to realize one thing about these seven churches before we can get into Nehemiah, simply this, that it starts with Ephesus, a church full of believers, and it ends with the church of Laodicea. And where is Jesus? He's on the outside of his church. Remember, that is not about Jesus knocking at your heart. It's reminding us he's on the outside of his own church. And so you have a church with no believers in Laodicea and a church full of believers in Ephesus. And so what we see as the common thread is simply this, the call to repent. And we see in Nehemiah chapter 9, the people have come together for one purpose, to repent. They have come together to repent. When was the last time you heard a pastor call his church to repent? When was the last time you heard of a church repenting? I would assume most of you have not heard a pastor call his whole church to repent because he might be out of a job the next day. So I'm praying I still have one tomorrow. <laughs> but the question we need to ask, church, is what do we as the Oasis Church need to repent of? Are we like one church where we have lost our first love, where we've lost a zeal for the gospel, with we're okay just waiting for heaven to come? We don't care about loving Christ the way Christ loved his church. Are we like one church where there's grotesque immorality? Are we like one church where we have fallen asleep at the wheel? Are we like one church where we have no zeal for the gospel and for God's word and we want our own opinion? Gosh, pastor, that's harsh, bro. Go easy on me. It's been a rough week. Well, let me tell you something. I know your pastor really, really well. I know him really well. And I know that there has been times your pastor has sought the applause of man rather than God. I know there's been times where he's been fair, terrified to step out in faith because he's so afraid to fail. I know there's been times where your pastor has said idle words, and I, so I know your pastor's not perfect. I know your pastor has plenty to repent from. Maybe you're in here and you are perfect. Come alongside me and help me. But I think if we're honest, we have a lot of things we need to repent of. And so we're going to see that this morning the importance of repentance.
So here we go. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. By the way, here's a little, here's a little nerding out for you. So all my intellectuals, you're going to love me. All my non-intellectuals, you're going to hate me. So here we go. Um, what repent literally means is to turn from, to turn away from, or literally to change after being with. If that's not the coolest definition of repentance, I recognize who I am and I don't like it, so I want to be more like Christ. Does that not capture the essence of repentance? So, to turn away from who I am to be more like Christ. That is the definition. So, here we go. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. This is the word of the Lord where we find the authority in the church says this. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all the foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. So first thing we see is the people have assembled. The people have come together. Last week, if you remember, we talked about unity and worship. That worship coming together is the call of Christ. By the way, as early as 100 AD, the church was meeting at least once a week for the preaching and teaching of God's word, for the prayers of the saints, and for the singing of the people. So we have that kind of working for us, and so they've come together. So the important part is for us to come together as a people for the worship of God. Why is together so important? Just like in a symphony, you can have the trumpet player play his piece and it sounds nice, but it sounds even more beautiful when all instruments are playing their same piece. So God's people come together together in worship. Why? Because that's how God has orchestrated it. He uses the body as for an example, right? Uh, So coming, the whole body comes together. Why? Because we are together. He uses flock. That's obviously plural. You can't have a one sheep flock, right? So what we see is these analogies of God's people coming together for God's glory. So what remember last week, right? They were assembled together. They said, bring out the book. They read the book, the law of Moses for six hours a day. If you remember, because you've gone through a reading plan, you know what? Then in Nehemiah chapter eight, we didn't get to it last week, but I know y'all did a great job in your reading plan. Uh, We read what? After they got done reading, what happened? Ezra commanded them, do what? Go, and I want you to eat the fattened calf, drink the wine, and do not weep, which means what? Celebrate. Why? Because 70 plus years of no worship, and now the temple's being rededicated, and we have worship again. So celebrate. Now we get to chapter 9, and it is a very bleak change, right? So you got people mourning, weeping, they've put dust on their head, and they've put themselves in sackcloth. What is sackcloth? It is a very, very itchy, 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 scratchy, uncomfortable type of clothing to make you feel miserable. That is its purpose, so that you would be miserable. And then what? Fasting. Fasting. Um, We don't talk a lot about fasting. I don't know why we don't, but we don't. Um, It is a command of Scripture that God's people are to fast in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, Pardon the pun, I'm going to say it again. Fasting should be a regular diet of the Christian. Fasting should be a regular diet of the Christian. So why do we fast? And the answer is first, because the Bible commands it. There you go. But why does the Bible command it? Why is this an important part? Because in essence, it is a physical manifestation of what the gospel is. Remember Christ, what did he say? If you want to be one of my disciples, you must do what? You must deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. We like if you want to be one of my disciples, and we really like follow me, because those are easy. But man, when we talk about denying ourselves, ooh, I only want to deny myself if I like it, Lord, right? That sounds like me. Okay, I'm not sure if it sounds like you. That sounds like me. Uh, and in case that wasn't clear, what do you say? Pick up your cross, die to self, and follow me. John 3.30, I must decrease, he must increase. So what fasting does, it's, it's the denying of food to self so that Christ may increase evermore. Fasting is a reminder that Christ has called you to give up your life, to give up the things you love, the things you enjoy, so that you can find the joy of Christ.
Next, what fasting does is it always refocuses you. Why? Because here's a shocker. This is a big secret. When you fast, you become hungry. When you become hungry, your stomach growls and it hurts and it's uncomfortable. And when you feel that, you go before the Lord in prayer and you say, God, I am giving up things because I want to be more like you. Shape me to be more like you and less like me. It refocuses us in prayer. So the question you need to ask is, when was the last time you truly fasted? And by the way, I know there's a medical reason some of you cannot physically fast, so please know that. I understand that, but the majority of us can, and it's hard. It's just hard because we're giving up something that has been a routine for us our whole lives. Which brings us to the next part. Life is full of routines. Um, what does the world describe as life but a big rat race, right? I go in, I punch the clock, I punch the clock, I count the minutes so I can go home, sit in front of my TV, let that wash away so I can go to bed, and we find ourselves bored in life, going, I, if I could just get to the weekend. That's how the, that's how the world kind of describes, right, life. What does fasting do? It breaks up the monotony of life and causes us to thank God. God for the blessings of things like food, shelter, comfort, loved ones. It causes us to go before the Lord and say, am I being transformed by you, O oh God? Which brings us to that next part about denying ourselves and refocusing. Church, I want you to hear me. If you are in here and life is just mundane, it's probably because you're looking to get to the weekend. But if you're fasting, what are you thinking about? I just want food. And so it forces you to live in the moment. I'm not saying don't plan. By the way, please have your three, one, three, five, ten year plan or whatever the experts say. Please plan well. But what it causes you to do, am I glorifying God today? Am I using every minute God has given me for the glory of God? And that's what fasting refocuses us to. And finally, for those of you that can't find time, for those of us, sorry, not you, for those of us that can't find time to read God's word, how great would it be if you gave up food to read God's word? Because if you've made time to eat, you clearly have time to read. So if you don't have time, what a great reminder of how important it is to make time. Because what fasting does is it brings us to the table of God and carries us away from the table of man. And so this is what fasting is doing. It's the denying of self. Pastor, that sounds weak, bro. You're calling me to be weak and meek. Yeah, Jesus Christ did exactly that. He became the slave, treated like a slave, treated like an animal on the cross for the glory of God. Do you trust in God's word? So this is what fasting does. And next, what did they do? They stood up. They stood up and they, it says that for a quarter of the day, they read the law and for a quarter of the day, they confessed their sins. So uh, real quick, just, this is for free. Here's a little party trivia for you. A quarter of a day to a Jew was three hours. Why? They considered day daylight. Daylight was about 12 hours. So um, that's what it was. They don't work on a full 24 hour calendar. So um, they just consider day about 12 hours, just FYI, it's a little party favor. So um, three hours they read the law and three hours they confessed their sin. Think about that for a moment, church. Three hours they confessed. Think of how much time they spent in prayer. Think of how much time they spent in the scriptures. So remember, what we saw last week is they said, what, bring out the book. And so what we see is what has happened. They brought out the book, they've read the law, and what has followed was confession. Why? Because when you read the Bible right, you don't read the Bible to be correct. You read the Bible to be corrected. 
You go to the scriptures so that the scriptures can correct you, not to validate your opinion. So this is why Nehemiah chapter 8 is bringing out the book. Nehemiah chapters 9, they're still reading the book. And then they confess. So I, I want to mention confession real quickly. Um, again, confession needs to be a regular, steady discipline of the Christian. If your default position is to be more outraged by the sin of others than your personal sin, that is your first sign that you lack confession in your prayer life. If your blood boils more by other people's stupidity, if your blood boils more by the culture's acts, if your heart rate increases at the lawlessness of others more than the lawlessness of your own heart, that is a very good sign you lack confession in your prayer life. Because just like Revelation, remember, Jesus goes to the church first and says, you need to repent. Why? Because repentance, repentance is an apologetic to the world. Repentance is part of your ministering of the word, of the word to the world. So Everything centered around for God's people. Everything centered around, thus says the Lord. And so what are they doing? They're confessing, and confession leads to repentance. Right confession leads to repentance. So notice that. So I want to talk about confession and repentance for just a moment. First of all, I want to mention, confession is difficult. It's incredibly hard. Why? Because it is the breaking down of yourself in order to get rid of the numbness that the world washes over us. Because what we end up doing is we become up sideline coaches and we say, they are so terrible without saying, and I am so terrible because I struggle and battle in battling sin. And so what confession does ultimately is it breaks your own self. Why? Because Jesus says, I will exalt the humbled and I'll humble the self-exalted. Let me tell you, it is better for you to break you than to have Christ break you. Revelation says, I am a, he, Jesus came as a flaming, flaming, flaming person with a, tongue, with a sword sticking out of his tongue. Let me tell you one thing. I would rather have you break you than Christ break you. And so, confession is the breaking of self so that Christ can heal and build. And thus, brokenness is Christ's pathway to freedom from bondage. But mere remorse is Satan's counterfeit to keep you in it. Brokenness is Christ's pathway to freedom, while remorse is Satan's counterfeit to brokenness. And so what happens? God's word reveals to you what you need to confess from. And then in verse 5, they say what? Stand up and bless the Lord from everlasting to everlasting. And then what we see throughout all of chapter 9, the rest of chapter 9, we see a very long diatribe, a history of God's people. And what are they saying? They're giving a history of God and how God has treated his people. We've been reading through Acts. This should look very familiar. You all remember Stephen did the same thing. This is a very common practice for the Jews when it comes to confession. We see it in the Psalms. We see it in the prophets. They do this a lot. They look back at their history in order to understand God. Why do they do this? Here's why. Because you and I get so tempted to think it is God who is lacking faithfulness, but when we look at the history of God's people and when we look at the history of our own heart, what do we realize? It is not God's faithfulness that is shaky. It is our faithfulness that is shaky. Pastor, I need some good news, bro. You're coming hard. Well, let's keep going. And so we realize this simple fact that confession reminds us that God has been faithful even when we are not. And what we see here in verse 6 and following is this simple fact of what? Praise and worship amidst the most dire of circumstances. When we take a history, when we look at the history of our own lives and of God, we realize one thing, that God's people always celebrate the goodness of God amidst even the most dire of circumstances. 
the whole New Testament written amidst heavy persecution. And what does the New Testament writers always say? God is so good. In your most dire circumstances, are you praising God? So let us look real quick at verse 6. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made the heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Notice how God's sovereignty is central in his first appeal to confession. God's sovereignty is the first area they go to in confession. Now, if you've been around me long enough, you know sovereignty is one of my favorite topics because it's one of the Bible's favorite topics. What does it mean to be sovereign? It means to be king overall. It means to be in complete sovereign rule, reign, and control. It means simply this. There is not a dust particle that falls to the ground without God's explicit permission. It means God is in charge of good and he has power over every single evil deed that happens. Wait a minute, pastor, you haven't thought this through. Are you telling me that in the first 400 years of the church, the church went through immense persecution for 400 years? you tell me God was in charge there? Absolutely. Wait, pastor, are you sure there's fires roaring up next to us? God hasn't done anything. Are you sure he's in charge of even those fires? Absolutely. Wait, pastor, are you telling me that God was in sovereign control and reign over Hitler and in the murder of six million Jews? Absolutely. Wait, pastor, are you telling me that as we have babies being murdered in the womb and sex slavery on its ultimate all-time high, are you telling me God is in complete sovereign control? Absolutely I am. Well, I don't know if I feel comfortable with that. Well, I would rather, I would rather worship a God who's in complete sovereign control than a God who is not. And so you and I may not understand why things are happening, but what we do understand is that God rules and reigns. His word says that the world is a footstool to him. God is in charge. And my friends, this is not a philosophical principle. This is a biblical truth that every New Testament writer celebrates. Do not make this a Christian slogan, but find the joy of God's sovereignty amidst even the most dire circumstances. I don't believe you. Prove it to me. Great. You've already read it this week because we were working through Acts. And what does Simon Peter say in Acts chapter 2? Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, attested to us by the scriptures, by the preordained plan of God, was crucified. How? By the hands of lawless men. If there was ever a time in history that the worst, most unjust thing happened, it was the cross and it was planned for by God himself because what man means for evil God means for good, Genesis 50, chapter 20. So, yes, I say to you, church, God is in control, and we celebrate that fact. And we do not hide from it. We do not explain it away. We celebrate it because the the Bible writers celebrate the fact that God is in control. So what does that mean? It means exactly how Christ prayed. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? What does he say? If there is any way for this to be done besides the cross, let's do that, O Lord. Yet not my will, but your will be done. What does that mean? God, I want you to undo my will if that means your will to be done. So what is yours prayer and my prayer, church? It's simply this. God, use me however you need to. Beat me. Kill me. Do whatever you have to do if it means your glory being shown for us because I trust your plan and not my plan. I trust your word and not my word. I trust your sovereignty because I bow to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and I have no other master. And so we're going to, I want us to see this whole section uh, I know you're like, hey, we don't have six hours like they did, so that's okay. I'm going to summarize it for you in two verses. We're going to look at verses 13 and 16, and we're going to compare and contrast these two things, and then we'll see how confession really plays out. 
13 says this, You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws and good statutes and commandments. Verse 16, But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. It's easy to follow the Bible when it comes to things we already agree with. It's easy to follow God's commandments when it's things we're already doing, where we run into issues, where we become the Pharisee of Pharisees is simply when the Bible commands us to do something that we don't agree with. That's where we run into issues. And what we see here is we see a confession of sin. God, I have sinned. We have sinned. There has been sin. I know you gave me the law. I know you gave me your word. I know what the word says. And I know I have gone the other way. So what do you and I do when we go into prayer and we go into confession and we're like, I don't have anything to confess? Let me share with you Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preaching, said this, Christ will never be sweet unless our sin is ever so bitter. Christ will never be sweet unless our sin is ever so bitter. So I did like, I just took 30 minutes. I did 30 minutes of Bible reading. And these are things I found also thanks to John Piper really helped me with this. Here's a few questions that just convicted me. And these are only a few. So again, 30 minutes. Imagine if I had an hour. Matthew 22, 39. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The Bible defines love as what? Sacrificing, serving one another. Am I serving others as much as I am serving myself? John chapter 15, you are mine if you do what I say. Have I served those I have come into contact with and loved them as much as I love myself? I love the book of Philippians, so here we go. Philippians chapter 2, do not look to your own interests, but rather look to the interests of others. Do I decrease so that Christ may increase? Do I humble myself so Christ can be exalted? Have there been times where I found myself prideful in my own self rather than giving praise to Christ? Philippians chapter two again, do not grumble. Have I complained? Have I thrown a pity party? Have I whined? Philippians chapter four, rejoice in the Lord always. Do not be anxious with prayer make thanksgiving? Have I been paralyzed in fear? Have I been anxious? Have I actually thanked God for everything he has given me? Ephesians chapter 4, has any bitterness come from my mouth? Have I said something that has torn others down? Ephesians 5, 16, make the best use of time. Here's your convicting one. Have I wasted any time this week building my own kingdom rather than God's? So much for me being perfect. Is our pastor even a Christian? I don't know. You tell me. I mean, if those convicted you, it seems like we're all in a process of being sanctified, being made more and more and more and more like Christ. And so what we need to do is we need to tear apart the scriptures and we need to ask the very, very, very important question. Am I being holy as Christ is holy? So what is the good news? Here's some homework for you. If you've been around me, you know I don't give a lot of homework. The Monday night, because they get to review the past week, they're going to be able to really check the homework. Uh, David, make sure we do this on Tuesday night at our home group. I want you to read uh, Nehemiah chapter 9 tonight. And I want you to see every time it says you, every time it says you, I want you to circle it because it's talking about God. Circle it, highlight it, underline it, put a big star around it, and notice it. And then I want you to do this. I want you to see every time you see the conjunction, but. That conjunction, but, I want you to circle that. Because here's what we see. God, you have done this. You have blessed us. You have given us your word. You have commanded us. But we have stiffened our neck. We have gone our own way. We have done our own thing. We have done this, but you have done this. Because the whole gospel centers around those two words. But, but. 
God. Ephesians tells us, but God being so rich in mercy, even though you and I were sons of disobedience, following the course of the air of the principalities, doing our own thing, but God being so rich in mercy with the love in which he loved us, sent his son to die for us. The whole gospel centers around, but God. And the whole point of confession is us saying, I have failed, but God has succeeded. And I will put my hope in that. That's where I find my hope. That's where I find my joy. That's why I do not despair. That's why I do not fear. That is why I continue to preach the gospel because I have failed. The world has failed, but God has been victorious. And may it never be, church, that we think we are so holy because Christ said, this is how unholy you are. And he looks at the cross with the shame of the cross. Friends, confession is deeply connected to worship. I am not sure we can truly worship without confession. I don't know a biblical passage. Here's what confession ultimately does. It gives encouragement to other believers. Watch it. I'm telling you, go to your home group this week and watch how this happens and say, I have a sin to confess and make it real and then watch how other people are like, me too. And then what happens? Man, we need to do something. Man, we got to do something. We have got to do something. This is Psalm 51 as David's talking about his sin with, with his sin because he, 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 ha, he raped a woman and then had a man murdered. And he said, "Why well, my bones are broken, O Lord. Forgive me so I can teach transgressors your way. If confession is not a regular diet, you will have no hope of reaching a lost world. So a few practical ideas. First of all, bring out the book. Again, what I gave y'all took me 30 minutes, and I just read basically Ephesians and Philippians. Read Matthew chapter 5. I guarantee you, you'll have a lot to confess after you read Matthew chapter 5. So the first part of confession is bring out the book, search the scriptures, find what God has commanded you, and ask yourself one question. Am I doing this? Can I be doing it better? Where have I fallen short in this? Finally, ask yourself, has sin become callous in my own heart? Has sin become callous in my own heart? Have I sinned and said, oh well? And finally, recognize what the gospel says. 1 John tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful, he is righteous, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is important to our Lord and Savior because he says, I know, and I want to remind you, I paid for that. You keep coming to me. Don't go to the world. They're not going to help you. Don't go to Satan. He's going to counterfeit you. You come to me, the judge and the Savior, and I'll make you clean because I already have. In church, I pray, I pray. If you're mad at me because I just went so hard today, love me well, pray for me. But I believe, I believe that this is what is happening when they put earth on their head, sackcloth, and fasted. They were saying, we need to be serious about confession. Church, I pray, I pray that of those seven churches, we're of the two where God says, keep going in endurance. Let's pray.